So, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our expert session with Unispace. Um, we are joined today by Charlotte Moon West, uh, who will talk to us and, and who will inspire us uh, with thoughts around uh, the workplace beyond 2020. Um, just a call if you are just joining us now, feel free to turn on your camera. We would like to see each other. Um, mute if you're not talking and uh, we are also recording this session today um, so we can share it with on our YouTube channel later on um, and how the day is looking like uh, we'll, the focus as I said is uh, workplace beyond 2020 and the questions we would like to tackle is is the traditional office obsolete is working from home the new norm and is there any generational shift at play uh, propelling us forwards? And uh, we are joined by our experts, Unispace. We have Charlotte, but also a couple of other colleagues will join us. Um, the agenda is, sorry, it's not 75 minutes. It's actually five, 55 minutes. Um, uh, we, we, will, we will warm up a bit with some questions on the poll. Then we will have uh, Charlotte presenting and also we'll have some interactive uh, elements to hear from everybody. We'll also move to breakouts uh, for a bit of discussion. So uh, thank you so much, Charlotte, for joining us. Do you want to say a couple of words? Yes, um, I think it's, it's great to be able to join you this morning. Um, obviously, it would have been lovely to see you all in Zurich, but the circumstances don't quite permit at the moment. Um, so in, in my background, briefly, um, so I studied architecture in London uh, before uh, moving into management consulting for a number of years and then those two things have combined rather nicely into workplace strategy and change management. So I'm part of the London team for Unispace which is a business that covers uh, sort of design, strategy, construction um, and analysis and what we try to do is to really use the strategy to really cement what our clients need to understand their requirements beyond just um, we need X number of seats, X number of people in the building. It's really about understanding their businesses, understanding their people, and then really coming up with solutions that will both benefit people's experience of the workplace, but also to really look at what's the business impact of the space as well. So we do that through a number of different ways. Um, and what we've been doing really recently is trying to understand what does what, what are things going to look like um, after this particularly um, unique time that we're going through? So in terms of strategy, there are a number of tools that we normally use. We would often observe space, so walk around with an iPad, observe how people are using a particular uh, work environment. And COVID obviously means that's not possible. People aren't physically in the office for us to observe and, and for us to get data from them. So we've had to be a little bit creative and to start really rethinking how we can approach developing strategies in the absence of some of our kind of go-to tools and information that we would typically use. So what we've been trying to do is to really understand from our clients what, what are their thoughts, what are they seeing, what are the trends that are emerging, and what we'll be talking about today is an approach um, that we're describing as uh, propeller. And essentially, rather than this being a sort of scrapping everything and starting again um, post-COVID, it's really an acceleration of some of the trends and the changes that we've already been observing with clients. Super, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, we are looking forward to diving into this really hot topic uh, of, of the new norm. So hopefully you can see my screen now. We can, yes. Very good. Okay. So, I mean, in terms of our sort of basis, I mean, we're, we're a global firm. We have a number of different uh, projects and offices globally. So we're based primarily um, in Europe, uh, APAC and uh, the US and North America. And um, what we try to do is to really integrate design, strategy, and uh, delivery all into a single process. So this is why the sort of strategy element is so critical. And you can see a sort of example of some of the locations that we're currently um, in. So we're pretty, pretty spread out. We've got quite an international group. Um, and personally, I work mostly on projects within um, Europe. So typically uh, quite, a, quite a lot of focus on Switzerland, France, Italy, Germany, um, and Spain. 
And um, this is our kind of example of how we integrate everything. So what we try to do is kind of have a continuous process where strategy is really kind of keeping hold of the brief throughout the whole process to make sure that um, we're keeping the designers on their toes and also to make sure that what the client said that they want, both in terms of the design and the strategy, is actually what we get at the end of the process. So what we've been trying to develop and to consider over the last few months is to really understand what's, what's the kind of next step, what are the next few months going to look like? So I think at the beginning of the process, there was a bit of a sort of mad scramble to make sure everybody was actually able to work from home. So do people have laptops? And actually, surprisingly, in a number of quite big businesses, they didn't. So we had one client who as soon as the lockdown was announced, I think they ordered 10 or 15,000 laptops um, immediately from China before everything was stopped. So, um, you know, there's a big kind of investment in technology, just the basics to get people set up. Then there was a sense of, as we had the initial easing of restrictions, which I think a number of us um, are actually now um, experiencing lockdown again, um, there's a sense of, okay, well, how do we get the office safe? So do we buy petitions? Do we close off, rope off desks? Do we make sure that people have got hand sanitizer, temperature control, etc.? So once we sort of settled into that stage, we're now thinking, okay, well, what, what's actually going to work long term? We don't think people are necessarily all going to come back to the office permanently five days a week. So what's that maybe going to look like? And people beginning to consider what are the, some of the things that um, we need to think about. So in terms of understanding that, I think what we wanted to do is to really think about, you know, what are your thoughts at the moment? So I think, uh, Olive, we have a poll that we were going to add at this point. Yes, sorry, I'm talking to myself. I was on mute. Uh, let me share my screen again. Yeah. And we will ask you to join us on Mentimeter. I will just maybe show the voting instructions again to all of you. Perfect. So exactly. So how many? Sorry, I will just show people how to join us. So you can use menti.com and use an uh, code or just take a picture, scan the QR code, and then you will see the question. So I'll just pause for a second here on the on the screen so people can join. Let me flip back. You can still see the code for Menti here. Menti.com 7648232. Yes, I'm going to flip back to. <laughs> so I think at the midpoint, what we were seeing was that actually a lot of people were saying exactly this. People are thinking, how many days per week do you expect people to work from home? And typically what we're seeing is sort of two to three days per week. Hmm. Some organizations are seeing more. And I think it really depends on what people's perspective of future. So if we're talking three to six months, it's probably going to be more days from home. If we're talking 18 months time, we're seeing probably two to three. And I think what you're saying is three days a week is pretty much spot on in terms of what hmm. we're doing. So there's a sense that actually almost the time you're spending in the office is rebalancing against the time you're spending from home. So I think it's, it's good to see that you're kind of in line with what our clients are telling us as well. Mm -hmm. And in terms of changes to the workplace, obviously this prompts and I a sense a suggestion of, well, actually, if we're going to be using the workplace less, what does it need to do for us? What are the things that it needs to achieve? What does it need to do to entice us back into the work environment? So. I mean, it'd be interesting to understand how many people are expecting to make changes to their workplace or who are actively pursuing um, some form of change or update at the moment. Shall we flip to the second question then, uh, Charlotte, or would you like just comments uh, and people? Well, yes, I mean, if anyone has any comments around um, this sort of working from home balance, any sort of thoughts around that? I think, we're good. I think we're safe to move on. Should we yes. go ahead? <laughs> so over to you again to share, right, um, the screen. Yes, perfect. Okay. 
I've also invited people to share questions on chat. So if you're <laughs> mic shy, you can also <laughs> use the chat option and we'll be watching it with Bilge uh, to make sure any questions are picked up and uh, raised to Charlotte as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what we're saying is, yeah, people are thinking we're going to be working from home. That's going to have some implications around um, what needs to be set up in order to enable people to do that. And then beyond that, what do we need to do to the office itself? So I think that prompted a number of questions around what does the workplace actually entail? And as I think part of your discussion earlier was talking about sort of multi-generational workplaces, what are people's perspectives depending on where they're coming from? Mm -hmm. And um, you have this sort of traditional analog workplace where you've got kind of clear divisions between the space, the space that you're in and what you're doing. So you might have an amphitheater or some sort of flexible space where you can have a classroom set up or lectures. You will have a desk almost inevitably where you can do focused work where you can actually do um sort of typical day-to-day -day jobs and then you have more of a collaborative setting so that might look like a meeting room it might look like a more flexible uh, kind of stand-up space and then you'll have some sort of social space whether that's literally a kettle sitting somewhere to make tea with or whether that's something a bit more sophisticated um such as a canteen or a coffee point so really the sort of tasks are very tied to the specific space within this analog environment. But actually over the last few years, what we've been seeing is an overlay of digital media and digital technology onto that. And what this last sort of hiatus from the office and has really prompted is a, an acceleration of that process. So we have a good portion of people who have grown up with the internet, with technology, um, you also have a good proportion of people who've never experienced dial-up internet and have been born with a smartphone in their hand. So it's very, very different to how we were envisioning um, the workplace previously. And there's a lot of sort of multitasking going on. So you might be chatting to um, friends or family, sort of managing your personal life and things going on on your phone. But then you may also have chat windows open um, with colleagues and then you're perhaps focusing on something, uh, doing online learning. Uh, maybe doing sort of collaborative sessions like we're doing now. So everything's all in the same place and it's very much focused on digital. But at the same time, we know that digital can't do everything. So there's a few things that we know that digital doesn't do terribly well. And one of those is really social. So yes, we've all had sort of Zoom drinks with people, Zoom quizzes, Zoom scavenger hunts. We've had a whole load of clients giving us some very creative solutions to creating social environments uh, digitally but really the conclusion is it doesn't quite match up to what we need and I think particularly as we were wrapping up at the end of the last session that sense of people early in their careers I know that I relied a lot on being able to just sort of walk up to somebody in a coffee point tap them on the shoulder ask them a question or to sit next to somebody that was uh, more experienced than me and to learn from them and those pieces are really missing and very very hard to replicate digitally so what we're seeing really is we expect there to be a shift between how we spend our time between the home and the office. And actually, particularly what we're finding is that actually focus works pretty well at home, even with the interruptions that many of us experience. Um, and I think we've had, we've had all sorts of interruptions from people that people are kind of unfazed by now, you know, Quite often people, you know, they'll have their sort of child on their lap, it's perfectly fine, you can get on with the meeting. We've met dogs, cats, snakes, that was an interesting one. Um, but people are kind of blending their home and their work life quite well. And people are not, you know, it's not unprofessional to have children or to have somebody else in your house, you know, this is life. So I think people are getting quite a lot more patient and understanding with the fact that there's stuff going on around you. But in spite of these um, distractions and interruptions, you know, focus really does work pretty well um, at home. Similarly, collaboration, we're able to do the majority of the collaborative work that we need. Um, sort of basic team meetings, catch ups, project meetings, that, that works pretty well from home as well. But it's the face to face piece that's actually quite important. So being able to sort of discuss things, I think particularly when you're talking with um, external clients, it really met benefits from having that face-to-face -face contact and a lot of people are missing out on that. In terms of learning, 
a lot of learning can obviously be done on the job. You can, you're kind of learning things anyway as you're going through your day-to-day -day work. Um, many of us have kind of compulsory compliance training or there may be other pieces that you're doing in order to pursue professional qualifications and most of those can be done online. But again, it's that sort of mentorship piece that doesn't really work terribly well in a digital forum. And the social piece is really the bit that just doesn't really work so digitally at all. And um, although I think there's a sense that millennials and the people following us are um, very, very savvy and they're constantly on social media and that must mean they're being sociable. But I think there's a difference between contacting somebody um, or chatting with them or posting whatever you do on your Instagram versus actually having a chat with someone physically face to face. So although people are very connected, they're not necessarily getting that human interaction. So we're seeing a real shift in how the space is being used and really seeing there being a blend between home and physical office and really seeing the roles of both of those changing a little bit. So if you think about, um, I don't know if any of you are already involved in designing workplaces, but typically the first conversation you have is how many desks and you have a negotiation about what well, can people share desks a little bit or not. Um, and really, if people are saying they're going to be working somewhere else two to three days a week, that prompts a much bigger discussion about, well, do you need 100 desks for 100 people? Do you even need 80 desks for 100 people? What's, you know, what's the point of coming into the office to focus and sit at a desk if I could do that very, very easily from home? So there's a sense that, yes, the office still has a role, but it's not necessarily the role that we're used to. So if we think about, typically we would see 40 to 50% of an office space unoccupied through those sort of studies of people wandering around and tracking, is there a human there or not? And at the moment, that's probably 90% realistically, given the um, restrictions that we have. And even actually during the hiatus between the lockdowns, we were seeing very, very low levels of occupation. So if that's what we're experiencing at the moment, what, what do we need to replace those with? Rather than having a sea of empty desks, is there something else that we can think about? So what we wanted to sort of get you to have a little think about here is actually the workplace has evolved quite a lot through the last hundred years or so. It's also not changed very much in many ways. So you still have a flat surface with some work on it. You probably have a chair. You probably have somewhere where you can go and get water or tea or coffee. Um, and you might have a bigger space where people can have multiple conversations and have a meeting. Um, you know, if you take that basic model, that's pretty much what we've been doing for the last hundred years. Um, what's changed is things like going from having cellular individual offices or cubicles, um, the kind of shift towards open plan, where there was a massive pendulum swing from one extreme to another. And of course, nothing, it doesn't really work at either end of that scale. You're either squirreled away in an office, wasting a lot of space um, and being quite unaccessible, or you're sat next to somebody that chews really loudly and annoys you and you have to put headphones on and nobody's having conversations. So that sort of swing didn't quite work. Um, so things reverted back to more of an activity-based working model where people perhaps had, began to have laptops, could move around, they could say, okay, what have I got to do today? And what's the space that's gonna suit that? So creating a bit more of a variety of spaces then beginning to be a little bit more agile. So agile with a sort of capital A talking about, well, actually maybe I can go and do some work in a coffee shop or I can uh, choose to go and work from my client's office or maybe I have one or two days a week from home or perhaps I'm traveling more extensively. So beginning to be a little bit more mobile, a bit more flexible. And then that's evolved into agile which is the sort of buzzword where you bring the consultants in and everyone tells you you need to buy lots of post-it notes and whiteboards and start doing uh, Kanbans and stand-ups and all of that. Um, and then that's beginning to evolve more into a sort of project-based model. So that acknowledgement of people have a common task, a common purpose, maybe they're working on a specific initiative or project. So rather than saying, I am a finance person and I'm going to go and sit for finance. It's more about, well, I'm working on our 2030 disruptive plan 
therefore I'm going to go and sit with the marketing people, the sales people, everybody that's involved with that initiative. And what we're seeing is from that beginning to move towards something that we're beginning to describing as propeller, but essentially as an extension of this natural evolution process. So I think at this point it'd be interesting to pause and to just get you to think about where you think the workplace that you work from most often when there isn't a pandemic um, is along this spectrum. I think if we I'm going to share my screen again to flip to the <laughs> to the poll. <laughs> And sorry, I noticed there are twice Agile, so just select the Agile of the capital A. <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, it's intentional. So I think that's also a big problem um, mm. within this industry. There's a lot of buzzwords. We talk about flexible, we talk about mobile, we talk about Agile, and that means something different to pretty much everybody that you talk to. So I think that's another um, challenge that we have where I think I know that um, particularly when I work in France and, and uh, Switzerland, as soon as you say open plan, everyone completely freaks out. No, 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 no. no. Um, and I think that's um, quite an interesting piece. So I think we'll move on to discuss what we mean by propeller in a moment, but this is the kind of progressive future office model. Um, but I think it's interesting to see that quite a lot of you are leaning towards this more kind of cross-functional um, project-based working type model. I don't know if anybody has a couple of little comments on that. It's not a comment, it's more like a curiosity because when you, when you, or a guess, let's say, is when you move more towards the propeller, let's say, is it somehow, um, is it this allowed maybe from smaller realities, like more startups where there are less people that they are able to share and maybe have um, more possibility to, to engage in other roles, let's say, no? I think, I think that's an interesting one. And I think a lot of um, big businesses have been talking about this <clears throat> sort of startup mentality is something you hear a lot. It's another one of those buzzwords that keeps coming up. And I think in a way that's exactly right. It's really taking that sense of everybody's part of the same thing. You're all trying to create the same uh, kind of outcomes and you don't necessarily need to be in a very, very specific space in order for that to actually um, to work. And it's really about offering people choice um, over the spaces. So I think there's a lot that we need to um, think about and um, I think it's probably worth us diving back into the presentation and just defining a little bit more closely exactly what we mean by propeller. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. So essentially what we're saying is that it's we're going from quite a, a traditional model where you've got some focus space, You've got some collaborative space, bit of social space, bit of learning, and that's kind of revolving around the needs of the business. So if I'm designing a space for, say, a finance team or a risk team, they're probably going to be a bit more on this focus side. If I'm going with a creative team or marketing, there's probably going to be a bit more of those collaborative spaces. What we're seeing really is that actually that's evolving a little bit more. So it's not just as simple as I'm focusing or I'm collaborating. There's actually a lot more that goes on in between. So if you think about the process of doing a project, you might be focusing on a particular uh, problem or challenge or trying to get something to the next stage. And in order to do that, you'll be having conversations with colleagues, but you'll also be needing a bit of time to actually think through what is the problem I'm trying to solve. So it's, it's not as straightforward as just having, I'm focusing, I'm collaborating. It's really about thinking, if I need to tackle a particular challenge, what do I need to be able to do that? I'm really thinking about um, innovation as well. So you've got a bit of um, going away and understanding things a bit better yourself. So maybe you're doing a bit of independent learning and then actually you're coming together with other people to discuss that um, within the context of what you're trying to achieve for the business. And then in addition to that, you've got this sense of um, community. So creating social spaces and actually this services the whole model because you've got those incidental discussions, you're overhearing other people, um, you're able to kind of feel a sense of belonging and purpose to part of the same organization. So we're not erasing these different kind of modes of work, but what we are doing is sort of rethinking them slightly in terms of the approach and kind of thinking about what's the experience of the workplace. 
So if we think about the sort of traditional model that you might have um, for a space, so um, you might have sort of 60% of your space given over to focus, usually desks, um, then you might have sort of 25% of your floor space given over to uh, perhaps uh, meeting spaces or more collaborative settings. Then you may have a little bit of a learning space, so usually that would be a kind of amphitheatre or maybe a sort of uh, classroom type setting. And then there could also be uh, some other um, spaces that might be more social. So I think it's really, um, you know, learning and social tend to be kind of sidelined a little bit. They're seen as nice to have. Um, and I think particularly when we think about some of the problems around presenteeism, some of those kind of cultural little bugs, um, you know, social spaces are seen as you're either on your break or you're slacking off. And actually, you could be quite easily sitting in your kind of coffee point being very productive. Um, so I think it's really unpicking that association between I have to be at my desk in order to be working. So I think when we work with businesses that are trying to break away from this model, it's really, really important for us to be discussing with management and particularly kind of middle management. So we did a project in uh, Lausanne um, a couple of years ago and the senior management were very much like, yes, we have all these amazing facilities. I'm perfectly happy to go and play tennis or go to the gym at three in the afternoon. Why on earth isn't everybody else doing that? And it turned out it was because there was a big chunk of their middle management who essentially would think that if somebody wasn't physically at their desk at three o'clock in the afternoon, that they weren't working or they weren't taking their job seriously. And actually, in reality, that's not true at all. You know, you could have been in the office from 7 a.m. You might be staying until nine o'clock at night. So if you want a little break in the middle of the day, what's wrong with that? So I think there's a sense of unpicking that piece between desk equals working and getting management to understand that people can be trusted to get on and do their job and that um, you know if they're not doing their job it's going to be pretty obvious you don't have to keep an eye on them in order to know that they're working if they're not producing what they're meant to that's a bit of a giveaway so I think that's similar to what we've experienced through this kind of enforced remote working piece where actually you've been kind of shuffled into having to um, just let people get on with what you've asked them to do and expect that they're going to do it. In terms of the kind of future models that we're thinking, um, there's a sense that obviously, depending on the industry and the type of business, there's going to be a bit of variation. So, the, you know, particularly when you're thinking financial, legal, um, anything kind of industry data-based, manufacturing, um, that's very much going to be more focused on sort of problem solving, operations, that sort of thing. Um, but community, again, very important. And then this innovation component as well is definitely coming in. And I think it's going to be pretty critical for most businesses. Um, I think in terms of implementation, um, the comment that's just come through, I think absolutely this is something that fully has to be coupled with change management. And it also has to be coupled with very uh, consistent buy-in from senior leadership. If you don't have your kind of CEO and their team on board, and if they're not pushing this change and adopting those changes themselves, you have an enormous challenge on your hands. So I think it's absolutely right. It's all very well changing the space, but unless you've got people following along on the journey and understanding why those changes have been made, you're, it's hopeless. It's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's not going to help. And I think that's, that goes for pretty much every um, project that we do. You can't just switch um, your kind of space around and expect people to suddenly go, oh, OK, I know how to behave now. It's, it's really got to be a kind of learning process and people thinking about um, kind of creating that process themselves. And I think absolutely. So in the comments we're having around kind of from country to country, there are huge differences culturally when we're working across, say, between the difference between, say, France and Germany or the UK, or even within countries, you know, the difference between Geneva and Zurich or London and Dublin, you know, there are huge differences that we have to think about. And increasingly, we're working with international businesses. So you don't just have a French workforce if you're in Paris. So I think it's, it's an interesting piece where you've got to cater to people's kind of particular um, personal and cultural um, 
needs needs but you've also got to understand how that fits into um, the business even something as simple as calling something a tea point or a coffee point can make a difference <clears throat> and i think we had we had a client the other day was going what is this tea point what is this tea point we don't drink tea we drink coffee in in sort of madrid saying no no tea so i think there's um definitely these cultural pieces that need to be thought about so i think if we pause for a moment, it would be good to sort of poll you and think about what does your space look like at the moment? What are the proportions? And then how do you think that's going to look tomorrow? Thinking about those kind of you know, community innovation problem solving. While we are waiting uh, for the results to appear on the screen, Charlotte, there was also a question about the element of learning. Uh, where does it fit okay. in the three elements uh, that you, you're describing? Is it the community or maybe something else? I think it's both. I think what we would say is that it's probably, um, it comes into the collaborative piece around problem solving. So mm -hmm. if you're working through a problem together with other people, you're naturally learning. And I think it also comes into some of the social piece as well. And what we would also say is that a lot of that's going to take place from home as well. So you'll have the kind of structured learning happening at home and that kind of dynamic mentorship, that sort of piece happening um, generally in the workplace. And um, I think, yes, I mean, we're seeing clients still putting things like classrooms and amphitheaters into their spaces. Mm -hmm. But obviously at the moment, it's pretty challenging to be able to get that working. So I think in the interim, what we're seeing is an expectation that people want to sort of catch up on that mentoring type piece where they haven't necessarily had those opportunities to just sort of walk up to somebody and ask them what they're working on um, or to understand that. Um, and I think we saw another question. Hold on. Talking about uh, mental well-being, I think. Mm. And I think that's a really important aspect. Um, and what I would say is that that piece where we're talking about sort of presenteeism and that kind of slightly oppressive culture that can have huge impact on people's experience of the workplace. Um, and I think there's a sense of a lot of businesses are now talking about psychological safety. Mm -hmm. So we're talking not just about let's stick in a meditation room and that ticks the box because that doesn't, I mean, usually that's also got to be your breastfeeding room and your prayer room and your first aid <laughs> room. It doesn't quite work. So I think we're seeing businesses rethinking mental well-being. It's about giving people some autonomy, giving them comfort. Um, and then also if you're thinking about having people with um, different abilities or different um, diagnoses within the business, mm. um, what are the different elements where you can give them an opportunity to feel comfortable too? So whether that's somebody who is neurodiverse and maybe is more sensitive to light or to sound or to temperature, do you provide enough choice of settings where that person can find somewhere that they feel comfortable um, or do they also have a space that they can come to where if they're feeling overwhelmed it's okay for them to step away so i think there's some really interesting pieces around that as well charlotte maybe we continue with the presentation i'll try in the background to fix the results uh, showing up because we can see 14 people have responded but somehow results are not okay sure. don't worry we can, perhaps we can grab it at the end Yes, perfect. We'll do that. <laughs> Sharing, I can switch back over. Yes, thank you. And thanks everyone for participating. Thank you. There we go. Exactly. So I think what we've got now is really thinking about what does that mean for the space? So what we've seen is that traditional model, you have desks, 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 because you've had 25 conversations um, with management <coughs> and nobody wants to tell people that they don't get their own desk anymore. Um, and often you've also got offices, offices, offices as well, <laughs> in, in addition to that, because you had a tough negotiation trying to persuade people that maybe having a space sitting there, I think we did a project recently and um, the C-suite, so the sort of executive committee at the very top of the business, they had enormous offices. Um, one of them, I think was 72 square meters, which is only slightly smaller than the house I've just bought. That was his, personal office and um, we worked out they had two and a half thousand square meters of space in personal offices empty on in their building at any given time so you've got a pretty good argument there to 
scrap them and your chance of finding an executive in one of those offices um, you would, they would only actually physically be there about 9% of the time. So we're seeing some pretty compelling statistics um, in favour of going to a more flexible model, even before COVID, to be honest. Um, but I mean, even within the traditional model, yes, you've probably got assigned seating, but you've, you've still got some variety of space. You might have a very gentle degree of desk sharing. You've got some collaborative settings, uh, social setting. But what we're looking towards is really thinking about what are the different spaces that people need to be able to cater to um, thinking about what are the kind of things that need to happen? So more of a focus around, say, uh, community spaces. So offering people a kind of blend of different settings. So perhaps kind of a canteen type space that's also being used throughout the day. Um, these kind of spaces are really great for kind of one-to-one -one conversations with people, maybe kind of having a chat with somebody that's having a difficult day. Um, and just if you fancy a change of scene, because I think that's one of the things we're learning from working from home. If you're stuck sitting in the same space for eight hours, pinned to a Zoom conference, you don't feel great at the end of the day. Um, so just being able to sort of have a little change of scene and to think about somewhere else to work from. And although we're sort of colour coding this and splitting it across three different types of space, it's not a sort of hard boundary. It's really just sort of thinking about what's the proportion that's going to be appropriate. So if we sort of dive in in a bit more detail, um, you can look at some of the different um, <clears throat> types of spaces that we might be thinking about, and then also offering a kind of technology overlay as well. So creating kind of digital um, information and perhaps having kind of uh, touch screens or having kind of smart boards where people can collaborate and communicate. Um, I think we're obviously using Padlet a little bit later in the session. Um, but, you know, things like that where perhaps you might have somebody that's um, at home or they might be in self-isolation. Um, can they still participate in these kind of brainstorming sessions um, when they're in the office as well? So I think there are some really interesting elements to consider. So offering a kind of experience of maybe sort of coming into more of a check-in type space where people are coming in. You've got kind of lobby space that can also be used for work. Um, maybe integrating some elements of brand as well. So you're coming into the office to feel part of the business, to meet your colleagues and to socialise and also to really understand what the purpose of that business is that you're working for. Um, then thinking about sort of uh, bleachers type um, seating. So this could be a learning space. This could be about uh, coming together to share different projects. So for example, within our business, we have um, these type of sessions, or at least we did, pre-COVID, where um, somebody would come and present a recent project <clears throat> to everybody and we could all learn from them. And then some of the more conventional settings, those that are offering, still offering some kind of focus spaces, phone booths, etc. Um, and then beginning to think about some of these new kind of spaces. So maybe you have a kind of lounge environment, a meeting space or collaborative space that's less formal, that's offering more of those kind of soft settings. Um, and I think it's been amazing during COVID that um, you know, we were working with a number of clients in the legal sector and apparently the senior partners at these big law firms, they really like COVID because what it means is that when they're talking to their clients, their clients are in, a, in their own home, they're in their own personal space and they're immediately more relaxed than if, if they're in a sort of fancy boardroom with a lot of formality in the middle of Canary Wharf. So there's a sense that um, a more relaxed space can mean that people are actually more at ease and you're able to have much, much more detailed, frank conversations and build up those relationships more quickly. So in terms of thinking, you know, we have sort of library spaces as well. So somewhere that people can come away from their desk where they can actually just focus. Um, generally, we'd have a sort of do not disturb kind of rule put onto that space. So talking again about this sort of behavioural change element. If somebody's physically moved themselves into this library zone, that communicates very clearly that they don't want to be interrupted. So it's really helping people to learn how these different spaces work and interact and to make sure that um, people are able to respect those rules. I think the biggest measure of success is that if you're able to have an intern walk up to the CEO and say, would it, would it be okay if I use that space? That's kind of big measure of success. What you want is for people to feel that it's their environment, whether they arrived yesterday or they've been there for 30 years. So just a sort of quick preview of some of the kind of community type spaces. I think we're seeing clients really embracing some of their outside space. Um, obviously, depending on where we're coming from, 
Um, we've seen a lot of clients putting in terraces in Zurich and London, so very optimistic people there. Um, and obviously it's a lot more common when we're thinking about um, other countries such as sort of Spain and Italy where those spaces are perhaps not completely wet and covered in rain for more of the year. Um, and then you can see the sort of learning type environment. So you can have flexible solutions just through furniture um, or you can create um, kind of social experiences there as well. So you might have um, kind of cinema club or you could use yoga or Zumba or some sort of activities that could take place. And if we move on, just a bit more detail, so around innovation, so a lot of focus on kind of being able to stand up, draw, scribble, whether that's digitally or otherwise, uh, creating sort of little break points where you're creating planting, um, divisions, flexible seating, and um, a lot of clients are putting in solutions like um, kind of portable walls or uh, molo walls where you can move around partitions depending on the need for the space. Um, what this also means is that um, these designs are a lot more flexible. So rather than creating a lot of built joinery, what you're doing is you're creating um, different spaces and different atmospheres and kind of flavours of space just through the use of furniture and different design signals and cues, so maybe slightly different textures, colours, um, lighting, etc. Um, just to kind of create a shift in atmosphere and distinguish different environments from one another. And then here you have the sort of problem solving spaces. So you might have a um, kind of group coming together, discussing what the particular issue is that they need to deal with that day. And then you've got focus spaces nearby where people can move away and actually go and think through things and then come back together again. So we've been beginning to think through this. I mean, this is not um, a kind of absolute model. I don't think you would cram all of these massively variety of different spaces into the same uh, scheme. But this gives you a flavour and, and a sort of indication of what the kind of things could be. Um, sort of another little preview of the community space. So you can see, again, lots of emphasis on greenery. Um, talking about the wellbeing angle, creating kind of little game spaces where people can uh, take a little break. Um, we're also seeing a lot of clients putting in sleep pods as well, um, which they are enormously expensive at the moment. But I think particularly in the environment where you have a lot of people travelling internationally, I know that when I've kind of been up at 4am for a flight, I'm arriving at an office at nine in the morning, having 15 minutes to just close my eyes makes a huge difference to my day. So I think people are really taking well-being quite seriously um, as we're beginning to think ahead and design for the future. So in terms of kind of home versus office, what we're seeing is actually you've got these kind of traditional, um, you know, focus, uh, learning and then well-being. So being able to take a break, being able to go and walk the dog or stroke the cat or play with your toddler. Um, and then that's intersecting with perhaps part of your week where you're spending time um, in the office, where you're focused on uh, being around other people, um, using different technology um, and creating a sense of kind of community. So what we're forecasting is a small degree of reduction in space where that's possible. So obviously people have lease expiries, which can be very expensive to extricate themselves from. Um, and what we're seeing more importantly is actually a reconfiguration and a rethinking of the existing space and not necessarily completely scrapping everything, but really taking kind of strategic solutions, thinking about um, what's gonna be mobile, flexible, what could perhaps be stripped out or stripped back in the event that we need to create social distancing again. Um, and really using technology as an overlay to bring everything together. So beyond that, we're sort of thinking about um, almost thinking, breaking work out into the city as a whole. So perhaps you'll have a central uh, city location which would be your hub, and then you would have little smaller spoke type offices where perhaps they're in kind of key um, suburbs or commuter areas. Um, and then people are coming together ultimately in the say in into the center um, to conduct key initiatives. So you've got your home, you've got your potential kind of satellite office, and then you're able to move back into the center and come together. So rather than just uh, scrapping expensive central space, what we're saying is that this still has a role and that there may be some creative solutions, perhaps using co-working space um, or kind of shared environments where you can begin to um, think about how people move through the city as well as how they move through the workspace. So I think at this point, um, it'd be good to sort of move into some of the exercises um, through Padlet that we were discussing. So I think, Olive, we hand back to you. Sure, and thank you so much for sharing. Uh... 
so many insights from your work. The data was really interesting. And thanks to everyone who shared their questions. Um, I managed to uh, put the results of the Mentimeter into Padlet, so you'll be able to see it. I will paste it now into uh, the chat where you can access Padlet, so bear with me. Here's the link to Padlet. Marvelous. We have seven minutes to 11. We said we would finish at 11, so we are really, really tight on time. I would want to propose maybe the way to say, let's try to finish latest by 10 past. Yeah. If you have to go at a full hour, we totally understand. If you can stay with us for 10 more minutes, please do so. I will open the rooms for 10 minutes. There are many questions on Padlet, so maybe I, I can quickly show you. Um, yes, I think if we share the screen, I can just walk, walk you through quickly what we yes. learned from each of these. So I think thinking about what are the biggest challenges you've had from remote working? Um, what are the, some of the unexpected benefits? Um, and then what are the things that you've been doing over the period while you've been working remotely that have actually been really good? So um, what's the stuff that you'd like to actually import back into the workspace? Um, any kind of future workspace thoughts, so images, examples and sketches. And then I think um, this topic around mo using this moment of change, I think from the questions that you've been asking, I think many of you are already thinking about this. Um, you know, is this an opportunity to really um, kind of reconsider things like sustainability? Is it a chance for us to really create an environment that's really considering people's mental health and well-being rather than just kind of offering people a counselling service and ticking a box? So are there other initiatives and things that we can use this kind of disruptive moment to push forward as well? So thank you so much for joining this morning. So we'll give you a few, mo few minutes to uh, come up with some thoughts and um, thank you again for all of your participation. Thanks for explaining, uh, Charlotte. I will now move everyone to the breakout rooms and see you in 10 minutes, <laughs> if you can stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Great to see everyone coming back. Oh. And thanks for staying with us a little longer. Maybe we can quickly hear from some groups. Anyone wants to share what was discussed? What were the aha moments from the breakouts? Now I'll share my screen to look at Padlet. Brilliant. Some really good. Um, Very productive 10 minutes. Yes, <laughs> well done. Excellent. So I really like this piece around enhancing personal relationships and um, empathy. I think that's a really important point. Um, and people are seeing into each other's lives a bit more. And I think we can only hope that that sort of patience um, and understanding is going to transfer back into the workplace. I think that's a really perceptive comment. Mm. Wow. <laughs> uh, Self-care, that's a good one. I think being able to kind of curate your day around how you're feeling, I think is a really good piece. So, you know, if I've had enough at four o'clock and I need a walk or something, being able to still do that in the future, I think is a really good one. Um, and I think this commute time is, is good as well. I, I mean, I, I commute in London an hour and a half to the office and an hour and a half back. Wow. I do not miss being on the tube. I don't think anybody does, but I do miss that sort of circuit break airlock between home and, and work. So I think that's that's a really key piece as well, definitely. And yep, definitely enjoying the lack of um, increasing air miles, I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd probably be hanging around Heathrow or Geneva at some point right now. But um, yeah, it's quite nice to be able to actually not be up at four o'clock in the morning in a taxi trying to go somewhere. So I think that's a definite benefit. Um, I think the time zone piece, that's a, that's a challenge that definitely I've experienced. I think I've got colleagues in um, not only across Europe, but also in Asia Pacific and West Coast America. So somebody is always either in their pajamas or awake in the middle of the night doing a sort of anti-socially timed phone call. So I think that's a big piece that um, is quite challenging. And I think as long as you rotate it so that it's not always the same person that's mm. up at 1am, um, it can be worked as well. Um, Groundhog Day feeling, yep, definitely something that's um, 
part of it. Um, well-being, I think, yeah, particularly what we've seen is a lot of clients are saying, uh, when we're doing surveys with people, we're seeing a lot of people are actually saying they see the number of hours that they're working increasing mm -hmm. um, and it's harder to switch off. So there's a sense that, you know, everybody knows you're at home or at least you're supposed to be at home. <laughs> Um, so you can't really escape as a sense of being kind of pinned down and being very, very accessible. So I think finding a way to create some sort of digital boundaries. I know certain countries have laws and legislation. I think particularly France, you're allowed to not respond to anything after 6 p.m. Um, in London, it's definitely not the case. But um, I think yeah, we can adopt some habits from some of our neighbours um, to kind of create that work-life separation a little bit better. Hmm. Great. Any any comments from anybody else that was working on these? Can I say, just say that uh, the 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 I we talked well I talked she you know with I uh, with Sheena <laughs> I think <laughs> I talked <laughs> didn't leave her much space <laughs> sorry about that um, the the whole hours thing that's that's exactly what we talked about and uh, certainly uh, I've been. Um, working quite uh, quite intensely on different projects with different time zones, uh, pretty big different time zones, where you start at five and you finish it at you know at midnight, and um, and that's a huge thing that I think there's going to be uh, you know uh, the, the, the it's a huge problem that that we're going to face this um, you know expectation maybe not of employers but actually of clients. Uh, being uh, that you have to be available it's, it's all well and good to uh, saying that uh, you know you're, you're not allowed to do x in France but um, the reality of it is if you're working in an international space that your client expects you maybe to be there uh, and how can we manage client expectations and still fulfill their you know um, you know their objectives and and, and be yeah, be the supplier or the or the or the partner that they're looking for. So, what was what's your take on that? I think that's really important, and I would say it's about managing people's expectations very much. So, so I think quite often, you know, we're working cross disciplinary. So um, we have an approach where if we have a particularly intense um, period where we have a strict deadline, we essentially work twenty four hours. So we have a handover in the evening to people on the on the southern hemisphere, and then a hand back in the morning. Um, as we're waking up and they're handing back over to us. So we found that works quite well. Um, but I would say with accessibility for clients, it's really about managing um, what their expectation is, sort of setting an understanding of what the response time is going to be, um, kind of reiterating which time zones you're personally operating in. So I think within, within Europe, it's fairly straightforward. You're not usually kind of more than two or three hours out. Um, but when you're working more with kind of US, um, Asia, it can get quite complicated um, and you don't necessarily want to um, do the sort of old fashioned 1980s uh, trading thing of actually adopting their time zone. Um, as I know, some of my um, friends used to have to do where you're essentially living on Japanese time in London. So I think there's always going to be issues around that, but creating maybe a sense of, you know, having an out of office during the evening or having a note in your signature to say, you know, these are my working hours. Um, and I can be responding at certain times because, you know, everyone's getting emails from people at one or two in the morning. And um, as soon as you respond to one of them, you set the expectation that you will respond at that time of day. So I think it's the, um, although we want to please our clients, it's really setting an expectation as to what's reasonable um, and what counts as urgent. Um, so I don't know about anybody else here, but no nothing that um, I'm currently working on is going to result in people dying or have massive global consequences um, you know somebody's number of desks or an order for um, you know ceiling tiles no one's going to die it can wait 12 hours or eight hours good point yeah, for, for sure thanks for that <laughs> brilliant well thank you so much i'm afraid i have to jump off as well but sure it's an absolute pleasure um, speaking to all of you and um, i hope we can keep in touch and um i look forward to seeing what else the network has in store Definitely. We'll be in touch, Charlotte, too. It was great having you here. Thanks for all the insights and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we will be sharing recording, uh, as I, I hope, latest next week, but it, it will be with you as well. And okay. we'll spread some word around uh, this session. So thanks a lot for everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye.
Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.